Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Today's episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. Personal Capital offers insightful, free tools that help you manage all of your finances in a single location with one secure login. The tools are free, personalized, easy to set up and use, and give investors a convenient way to gain transparency into their finances. I know because I've been using the online tool for years for a holistic picture of my financial life, including investments and overall net worth. Today, for listeners of the Favor Show, Personal Capital is offering a special deal, two months of free advisory services on top of the already free tools. To learn more and claim two months free, just go to personalcapital.com forward slash meb. Again, that's personalcapital.com forward slash Meb. And now on to the show. Welcome, podcast listeners. Today, we have an amazing show with you for with one of the most respected quants out there. He's been doing research for over two decades, combining quantitative analysis with computer science, a little AI background thrown in to create various multi-factor analytical models. He's also a frequent speaker, writer, columnist, and he's the founder of Validia Capital Management. Welcome, John Reese. Thank you very much, Meb. So I'm calling you from warm, sunny California. It's snowy, cold in New York. But let's take a step back in time. I know your investment history, have known you for a while, but some of the podcast listeners may not. So let's go back to kind of, I would say, start at the origins of what brought you to starting an investment business? Because you didn't, much like myself, being from an engineering background, you didn't start out in the investment world. So maybe talk a little bit about the the arc that set you upon setting up Lydia. Well, there were two or three little things that led up to this and a, a big thing. One, it goes back to when I was still in elementary school, my father subscribed to the value line. So every single week had this great magazine or issue of 100 stocks with a lot of different quantitative uh, data that piqued my interest in the stock market and stayed with me for a number of years. I didn't act on it at that time, but it got my uh, interest. And I was uh, highly related to both the charts and the numbers. Then I went to MIT to study electronics and computers. And while I was there, I worked for the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. And my project was basically how to take wisdom and information from books and translate that into computer programs so the computer programs could actually implement the knowledge that was in books. That also was a second piece that would come to be useful many, many years later. And then the third piece is uh, after getting my uh, MBA and going out of the business world, I started my own company, grew that uh, over nine years, sold it to GE Capital, and then I was looking how to invest my own money, and this time for real. And at that point, I embarked upon a research project. I was reading maybe 50 different periodicals and publications at the time, Barron's Fortune, Business Week, Money, Smart Money, newsletters, etc. And I was asking myself the question, what one person should I listen to? Whose strategy should I essentially follow? So I started to write down each of the recommendations that came across them from each of these sources and kept statistical track, then started to go back for five years' worth of data to see who I could essentially follow. And after all that research, I came to the surprising and disappointing conclusion was that whoever I found that did the best over any period of time that I selected, whether it was one year or a shorter period of time, like three months or a week, whatever it was, there was no repeatability, no consistency in what would happen in the following or subsequent period of time. Therefore, I was unable to identify one key source of who indeed should I follow for the best recommendations. So along this time, I was also starting to read some of the investing books, many great investing books, when I came across 
one in particular that really stood out to me, which was Peter Lynch's One Up on Wall Street. So here we have somebody who already had a legendary track record who wrote about how he went picking stocks that made him successful. And more importantly, and here's where it goes back to the MIT artificial intelligence days, but the wisdom that he expressed in his book was a sufficient detail and included sufficient quantitative information and factors that I was able to translate that into a computer program that basically picks stocks according to my best interpretation of the way Peter Lynch said he picked stocks. So as I tested this out, actually the results were very strong, such that I was very encouraged to actually do that. And I started with a second book, which was uh, Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor. Two good first choices, by the way. Thank you. They've been excellent books, classic books. Everybody should absolutely read them. It will make them positively better investors. And I continued on. Ultimately, over the following few years, I codified 12 different gurus and created an internet website. This was in the the days actually just before uh, 2000 when the internet was actually just starting to take off and I was sharing my research on the website and allowed people tools with which they could evaluate stocks and basically x-ray the stock from the best interpretation would Warren Buffett, would Peter Lynch, would Benjamin Graham, what would they think of that stock? And more explicitly, they would say, exactly why. If they liked the stock, you could basically see it. If these models didn't like a stock, it would explain that why as well, so people could basically learn from that. So that's how I basically got started in the stock market investing and research business. You know, so there's so much to unwrap there. And it's so interesting because it's a lot of similarities and parallels to, you know, my career and things that we've done here. So One of the challenges from being a quant, you know, is that some of these managers like a Peter Lynch or Warren Buffett may have some sort of messy qualitative sort of assessments. Was was there any time kind of as you were looking at these where you saw some gray areas or was it actually pretty easy to quantify them? Did it matter at all? Maybe talk a little bit about the process of the first decade of doing this, kind of what you learned putting these together. Because I think a lot of people out there love stock screening, particularly there's some, I imagine, wisdom you can impart on that process and and what you learn. Well, you ask a very good question. It actually was a very challenging process. Most books, I actually had to read minimum of five times to really understand the detail of what was being said. In addition, I had to carefully look at each example displayed by the author of a particular stock that he picked out and why he picked that and say, did this actually correspond with what he said or does it reveal extra information? Does it reveal some sort of preference? Does it reveal a certain threshold or bias? Are there companies with certain debt-to-equity ratios that he would allow or not to allow, or is he saying he doesn't even look at that particular factor? So on top of that, I would usually see if there's any other publications by or about that particular legendary investor that would also help me to decipher what he was saying, if it applied in any way to a specific industry or excluded particular industries. So many times that there were these revisions for it. So I've talked to you know, a number of people who have tried to do this themselves after reading the books, and they usually find it a very difficult exercise to do. Now, a few people have actually done it. They've created screens and published it, and I'm usually shocked to find, in many cases, how different their screens were from my careful reading of the exact same book and material. And then on top of that, you also have various investors, legendary uh, authors, who come up with revised books or methodology. And one of the things that was very interesting, because I also implemented their revised methodology, in almost every case, their original methodology remains superior to their new revised methodology. I love it. And that makes total sense. You know, a lot of people revise them based on either what they expect the future to happen or revise them based on very recent performance. And we've seen this a number of times as well, where the actual messing around with a very simple algorithm causes more problems than good. So one or two more questions on this general process, and we can kind of dig into maybe some of the 
specific models and stuff. How did you kind of think about filtering, you know, this list? Because it almost seems to me like there's an infinite amount of book writers and academics and famous fund managers. You know, was it something that you thought about in your head? Say, hmm, I'm only going to look at value guys or "Mm, I'm only going to look at guys or gals that are what was the kind of the criteria? Because I feel like this could be like an endless process of coming up with like 500 possible portfolios. Well, actually, no, it wasn't an endless process. One of the first key factors is, is there a long-term track record? Somebody who has a one or three-year track record just does not count. I think numerous other papers have shown one-year and three-year track records don't provide any predictability toward the future. So the longer track record, the better. That was the first key thing. Then the second key thing is that most the books actually do not have the clarity with which you can extract the rules. For instance, a strategy that says you want to buy a company managed by excellent quality managers, that is not sufficient to implement. How do you define an excellent quality manager? Hey, I was going to say you asked 10 quants what quality means. And it's funny because we were doing this a couple years ago and looked at like 10 of the most famous quants. And they literally had 40 different factors that they put under the category of quality. And they were all totally, for the most part, many very different. So it's, <laughs> I, can, I can totally sympathize with that. That is so true. And even if they are talking about, well, you buy want to buy companies with low P.E. ratios, how low is low? What earnings do you use in the price to earnings ratio? Over what period of time is the earnings? So there are a number of different criteria. And then on top of that, like we'll probably get into the weeds on some screens and we'll kind of walk through one maybe to think about it. But listeners, you know, a lot of people say something like that, but it's whether do you screen for the, say, the bottom decile, so the bottom 10% of stocks. Well, if you're doing that out of 2,000, you now have 200 stocks. And so are you picking, then doing another screen to pick a consistent portfolio, yada, yada. Okay. So your one screen was it needs to be potable. Second, it needs to be a long enough track record to kind of ascertain it's not just short-term noise. How then did you kind of come down to this final list of final number Is that something you're consistently updating? Is it kind of a, you're one in, one out? What's the process there? Over time, usually it's not the legendary investors anymore, but particularly in the most recent decade, it's now been various kinds of factor investing and academic papers that have established long track records and usually have been through some peer review process and have been commented on by lots of other quantitative investors. That's usually the key criteria these days. And by the way, you know, there's from someone who's been doing this a long time, you know, what sort of tools had you utilized? I mean, I imagine 20 plus years ago, you know, there weren't as many options as there are today. Today, there's uh, probably a dozen great, even retail or individual stock screeners on the institutional side. You have the Bloombergs and FactSet. Was this something you had to build by hand? How did you kind of go about doing this in the, particularly the early days? First of all, the very first model with Peter Lynch, I actually started with an Excel spreadsheet and had to therefore retrieve the data by hand, a number of data points. It actually took about two hours to evaluate a particular stock. Then I was able to, over the years, subscribe to institutional databases. At one time, it was Maltex, and then over the years, it became Thomson Reuters, as an example, where you were able to get virtually complete fundamental data sets uh, across the entire U.S. stock market. And I was able to then, obviously using programming techniques, draw and do database uh, analysis of the particular stocks. So that became a tremendous helpful. So the screens actually were implemented not as a Bloomberg type screener, but in code using artificial intelligence techniques that actually go about thinking and making the statement the same way that the guru said that he went about selecting stocks. So we want a company that is in the top 10% of market cap, or maybe those that have a debt to equity ratio of greater than two under certain circumstances. And usually there are interesting variations of this. It's something we'll probably get into 
later on, but those who did use, let's say, a price-to-earnings ratio, and interestingly enough, less than half the gurus actually did, even though that's the most popular ratio, had some sort of proprietary twist on it that made it not a standard vanilla type of screening criteria. Peter Lynch, as an example, would not apply price to earnings criteria for companies with less than a billion dollars to sales, as an example. You know, it's interesting because the media, I think, does a very poor job of this often where, you know, they'll mention price to earnings ratio. And is it trailing 12 months? Is it forward? Is it 10-year CAPE ratio? Is it, I mean, there's literally a thousand different variants. And depending on how you talk about it, it gives totally different historical readings and often different takeaways. And so I think you mentioned in a time in a world of probably 500 or thousands of factors, you know, the specifics can actually make a big difference. Let me ask you one question on kind of the whole process of calling these managers, and then maybe we'll walk through a specific one like Buffett, just to kind of give some examples. One of the things I struggle with, and I don't know the answer to this. So if you don't have an answer, that's totally fine too. But, you know, often with strategies or managers in this case, you know, hopefully they have a long track record. But You know, one of the things that's a challenge to me so much, and this applies to anything, asset classes, managed futures, whatever it may be, is when to determine whether a period of underperformance is the manager's lost his touch, it was never a good strategy in the first place, or is it simply out of favor and it's a great buying opportunity? Do you have any general thoughts there or any suggestions? Yes, that is definitely a hard one. Where I basically lean on that is what is the length of the track record where this actually worked. So if there was a strong period of time, I have a lot of reason to believe that at some point in time, it'll come back in as a factor. One of the things that I found about all strategies, much to my dismay and I'll even call it disappointment, was that there was no strategy, not one single strategy from these gurus or some 250 other strategies that have looked at over time that outperform the stock market or even have guaranteed positive years every single year. And we'd all love to have that consistency, but all of the strategies come in and out of favor. And it is the fact that they go out of favor this for sometimes long periods of time that allow it to come back in favor. So I actually do believe when we've identified isolated either factors or particular guru strategies that have worked for quite a while, I have a fairly high degree of confidence that the performance may not come back in the full strength that it was originally, but will still return one or several years in the future. We'll come back to that in a minute when we get back into factors a little bit, because it's a topic a lot of people are certainly thinking about. I mean, we, if you look at a lot of managers, I mean, 2017 was kind of a graveyard for really famous hedge fund managers finally giving up. And so many top names shut down shop, had terrible returns after a long period of underperformance. And, you know, we've talked a lot about, and this may be a good segue into into Buffett, a lot of his style has been out of favor for much of the cycle. A lot of the stocks he loved in the early 2000s had monster performance. And it's funny because you always get the circular coming back to you know, has he lost his touch, which seems to happen about once a decade, and then it comes roaring back. Let's use that as a lead in to dig a little deeper into some of your models. And we can use Berkshire if there's another one you'd prefer to use, or Buffett, I'm happy to use that one. But why don't you take one of your models and kind of walk us through a general overview of how it may work? Okay. And by the way, Buffett is actually a good one. And overall, Buffett has used factors, and I'm speaking at a very high general level, that could be considered quality and low risk in terms of the factors that have mostly been successful for him. How that actually gets implemented when I do it is based upon a particular process that first starts to ask, is this even a Buffett type of company? Does it have a strong brand recognition? whether it's regional or national, does the company have the ability to pass on cost? Is the product line complex? There are only a fraction of companies in the market that actually meet those criteria. So first of all, that acts as an overall screening criteria. Is that a qualitative screen or is that something you can actually put into sort of a, a quantitative factor? 
that one turns out to be a qualitative screening. It has to be done by looking at each of the companies that are in the stock market and what is their brand recognition. Using Morningstar data, a lot of that corresponds now to actually having a moat. So in current times, you can use uh, Morningstar's uh, criteria for whether this company has a wide moat. Okay, And here's a more complex strategy than many of the gurus, but one of the first things he looks at is the earnings predictability of the company over a 10-year period of time. And he is the only guru that actually goes back that far and wants to see at least the monotonically increasing earnings each and every year with one set of exceptions. He's bought companies with up to a 45% dip in total over that 10-year period of time. So that could be like, let's say, two 20% dips occasionally. That won't turn them off. But overall, there has to be increasing earnings, usually steadily increasing earnings, over a full 10-year period of time. And there's a really, really important reason that he does that. His methodology actually banks on making an estimate of what will the company be earning 10 years hence. And let's face it, it's very, very difficult to predict a company's earnings, even for the current year, let alone for 10 years. So one of the things that he's doing to put that in his favor is saying steady earnings over the prior 10-year period of time for these types of companies is a very good predictor of what they're likely to earn over the next decade. So that's the first criteria. The next thing is the return on equity, again, over a 10-year period of time. He wants to see that that's greater than 15% a year for each of 10 years. He looks at the total capital, so not just the equity, but he adds the debt in, and he wants to see that the return on the total capital is at least 12% per year over, again, a 10-year period of time. Then he looks to see the retained earnings of the company. He wants to know of the earnings that have been kept and not distributed in any kind of dividends or shareholder buybacks, have the company made a profit with that in excess of 15% per year. So the utilization of retained earnings now becomes a criteria. Assuming that and that the free cash flow of the company is greater than zero, he wants companies that contribute cash, not pay cash, to pay for investments and replacement of property and equipment. Assuming it passes all these criteria, now he applies a second set of criteria, which is, is the price at the right point that I can buy it now, I will make my target profit. So it's not just good enough that it passes all those other kind of uh, requirements and criteria. He will then look at projected earnings from the company, projected return from the company over the following decade using two different methods, one projecting based upon the return on earnings, that he found and one projecting based on an EPGS projection, and it'll average the two. If both of those come out to be at least 12 to 15 percent per year, he says, yes, this is a good time for me to actually buy. So those are the steps or the screening that he has. I think I missed one other very important criteria he has, and that is a debt criteria. He would I'd like to see the debt of the company be able to repay from five years' worth of earnings, and if it can repay in just two years' worth of earnings, that would be absolutely wonderful. And, you know, as you know, that's very different. Most people have, like, a debt-to-equity criteria. He doesn't. He, he actually does it in terms of uh, how many years of earnings does it take to actually repay that debt. I love it. It's so nuanced. Then how does this actually play out? Do you update it once a quarter, once a year? Is it spitting out a certain amount of stocks? Is there a minimum market cap? What's kind of some of the operational logistics of how one might follow this? Well, two things. At Validia, I publish a list that is basically updated daily of what are the top either 10 or 20 stocks that meet the screening criteria and actually form portfolios out of those that are either updated monthly quarterly or annually, depending on how much somebody actually likes to trade. So I actually provide all those variations that each individual investor can choose based upon their own you know, investing preferences. When I actually then go the next step, which is managing client money, 
I then apply some additional criteria in terms of liquidity and minimum market cap size to ensure that the companies can be actually traded in volume. That's important because a lot of people, not to criticize the AAII, which is American Association of Individual Investors, we love love that organization. They're writing a lot of great people there, but a lot of their screens, for example, may kick out variable amount of stocks. You may have three one month, you may have 20 the next. And in some cases, you end up with companies that are, if I remember correctly, under 100 million in assets that trade really <laughs> on appointment. So you got to be careful with your screens. You know, one, that there's some consistency listeners or two that you can actually trade them and it be something that's representative of an actual possible real world outcome. One more question while we're on Berkshire and maybe we'll think about some other models. You know, a lot of people I'm sure listening would say, hey, instead of buying Buffett's screen, why wouldn't I just buy Berkshire stock? Is that something that you've ever looked at comparing? Is it similar? Is it different? You know, because he's got a lot of private operations of, you know, investments that aren't public. What's your thoughts there? I have two thoughts. One, I think people should hold a small portion of Berkshire, but two, it is not the same thing. At the size of Berkshire, they're very, very limited in the number of investments they can make. Uh, Virtually, you know, maybe there's 300 or 500 companies that they could possibly buy or invest in that would essentially move the needle on such a company with holdings that big. So because there's so many other companies that are available that would not be of interest to the real-life Berkshire Hathaway, people can invest in things that even Berkshire can't invest in right now, but following the original strategy that made Warren Buffett successful. Yeah, I mean, I think that echoes a lot of what Buffett has actually said, you know, where he said, look, at Buffett at 40 versus age 80, you know, when he had a lot less capital deploy, could do a lot more things. And he says that actually quite a bit where if he was managing 100 million, he could be a lot more opportunistic. And that's simply a mathematical, you know, reasoning because he's severely limited with his breadth. Like you mentioned, he only has a couple of hundred stocks in his universe, whereas you or I could probably operate in a world of of 2000. So it's reduced by say 75%. That's interesting. So by the way, listener John has a great book called The Guru Investor. I think it came out, by the way, like literally near... Didn't it come out in 2009? Yes, it did. Okay. So great timing for the performance of the stocks in the book. Maybe not the best timing on selling a bunch of copies when no one wanted to buy stocks because you, I think, were about a month away from the, the market bottom. But it's a great book. It outlines all of these screens. We'll post a link to the show notes and you guys can go read all about a lot of these other ones because they're There's some pretty famous, interesting screens in there. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. Guys, there's a lot of things I like about Personal Capital. They offer free digital tools that help me view all my investments in a single location on my phone, tablet, or desktop. The help they provide is highly personalized, including a sophisticated tool to evaluate what I'm paying in fees over time. And overall, they give me a thorough, insightful snapshot of all my finances helping me feel more empowered and confident in knowing exactly where my money stands. Do you know that the typical affluent household has 15 to 20 financial accounts? With Personal Capital's tools, you can link your account to common account types and even assets like property investments and stock options. And today, for listeners of the Meb Faber Show, Personal Capital is offering a special deal. Two months of free advisory services on top of the already free tools. To learn more and claim your two months free, just go to personalcapital.com forward slash meb. Again, that's personalcapital.com forward slash Meb. And now back to the show. As we talk about kind of the models and you've built these, are there any kind of common attributes to the models that tend to do best? You know, is it certain types of strategies you kind of gravitate towards, you know, in general, is there any kind of broad takeaways or do you advocate more of like a fund to fund methodology where you should invest in two, three, four, five of these guys to get a diversified portfolio? Well, Overall, for investment reasons, one should invest in several of the group strategies, ideally that are not correlated, because strategies come in and out of favor, and you really need to allow for that. So somebody should really pick several of their favorite strategies to invest in. But at any particular time, what are some of the more successful strategies? It's interesting, but they tend to be more value-oriented is one of the criteria. Second, even though each of the strategies are quite different in their own, and rarely do you see any two gurus using the same factor, one of the general factors that 
most of the gurus use is some type of debt criteria. And that is whether they use it as Buffett does. Actually, he was the only one who looked at debt in terms of how many years it takes to pay back. Other people look at debt to equity, total debt, long-term debt, various kinds of criteria like that. But usually there was a debt criteria, low debt or no debt being much better. That was part of the success factors. And it makes a difference when the U.S. economy goes into a recession. Uh, second thing that interestingly comes up is that almost invariably, each of these strategies wants to see that the company is profitable. They actually don't like and pretty much sun companies that whose most recent year, or perhaps even sometime over the past five years, have been unprofitable. And I thought that was an interesting strategy because there's so many concepts, stocks, and stories where the company is currently unprofitable, but these gurus, for the most part, don't like them. Interesting. And so, gun to your head, just because I know the listeners will ask this question, is there any particular model that has been backward-looking, rear-view mirror, outsized performer, or the best sort of screen historically? Is there one that kind of sticks out? Um, yes. Actually, surprisingly, lesser known, but it turns out the Foolish Eight strategy by the Gardner brothers. Well, the book goes back about 20 years at this particular point, but it's a fairly complex strategy that looks for high-quality stocks that has both value factors and momentum in them, and that has actually outperformed more consistently year-to-year -year and returned to higher performance than any of the other strategies. Interesting. But it makes sense. You know, a lot, anything that's particularly geared towards the smaller world often so many different reasons. Institutions can't play in the sandbox. There's less efficient market usually has some interesting potential. So we started to talk about some factors and we've already mentioned about a dozen of them, but maybe we'll kind of switch gears slightly and talk to talk about factors. And there's a lot of traditional building blocks, value, momentum, you both mentioned. And I think a lot about this because I'll be listening often to a lot of managers where they'll be talking in Barron's or somewhere and they'll mention a factor as important in their process. And then I'll go look at, say, Jim O'Shaughnessy's classic Bible, What Works on Wall Street. And it turns out that factor is really kind of irrelevant. And in many cases on screening for stocks are not that useful, but a lot of the kind of qualitative people will think that it's a very important part of their universe. Is there any sort of building blocks you think are particularly awesome? You know, where if I say, John, you got to construct a multi-factor portfolio stuff you like. And then the part B to that question is, is there any particular combinations that you gravitate towards as well? Well, it's an interesting uh, combination of both momentum and mean reversion, but figure out which stocks in advance each of those two factors will essentially apply to. I've been very interested recently actually in the the variations of momentum that have come up. What has caught my attention recently is idiosyncratic momentum, where you actually take out the traditional French family factors and see what's left in terms of the, comp the uh, stocks that are outperforming, and particularly identifying the companies that were outperforming slowly or gradually over a period of time as compared to suddenly all at once. I think there's a lot of potential there for that factor. So it's momentum, but it's now a unique perspective on momentum. Another one that's caught my attention, again, with momentum is, you know, traditionally momentum in academics is defined as month two through 12 months ago, ignoring the most recent month. One study that I read that I thought was very interesting and has some potential says the relevant momentum period is actually from month seven through 12 months ago. So I think there's another factor there that deserves more exploration. And there's a million layers to the onion, that's for sure. And the value factor, I think, also is very important, even though that has really underperformed since about 2009. To me, that is even more indication or stronger that it's like a spring being pushed down and it's going to highly recoil. So again, if a gun were put to my head, I would strongly want value as a very big, important factor there. And I would not have small cap as criteria. That I'm no longer sure if that exists or is gone forever or has been arbitraged away. 
but that's been gone for a long time now. Or exists sometimes in January. Yeah, that's a tough one. One of the things we always tell listeners about factors, I say, and really about any investment approach, is I say, you know, a lot of people say if you're using value, focus on the benefits of buying the cheap stuff. And that's all well and good, but it's also about avoiding the most expensive. So as you think about, yes, you're, you're picking the cheap stuff, but it's also think about as if you're wiping away the, you know, cream off a of coffee or sludge on the top of something where you're just cleaning off the bad stuff too, which can be equally important. Where do you weigh in on, you know, this has been a debate for the last couple of years between some of the big quant shops on factors that come in and out of favor and the ability to time them. Like people fall on sort of different sides of the seesaw, you know, because some factors, like you mentioned, go through years, if not decades of underperformance and then revert. And part of that possibly has to do to flows going in. So the example we often give is dividends over this cycle because everyone's looking for yield or potentially moving into momentum at times or value. Is that something you guys have ever thought about adjusting? It's another hard question, but is you guys have any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, it is. And we're still believers that when things go widely out of favor, that we want to tilt toward that. I mean, not make a 100% bet on it, because we don't know exactly when it's going to actually revert, but we do feel that there are very strong mean reversions in factors when they come in and out of favor, and that we can buy some extra performance when we emphasize a little bit more strategies that are greatly underperformed in the recent year or recent years. I know, you know, as this has done a paper on this and has not come up with a conclusion or says it's very, very difficult to do, I'm not going to dispute that, but my gut feeling is it's still an important part of investing. It still should be done. I like to think it's possible. I haven't found any magic implications or ways to do it, but I'd like to think it's possible. So, okay. So for the the listener who's listening in, he says, all right, I'm either going to hire John to do this or I'm going to do it on my own. Are there any practical takeaways? You mentioned using multiple managers. Is there some general suggestions you could give to listeners? Say, look, this is the amount of stocks you should target. This is how often you should rebalance. This is the way you can think about doing all these sort of things. And one of the reasons I asked this is because I remember back to an old comment from Joel Greenblatt, where he used to have a screener on his website. And he said that a lot of the people that took the screener and picked their own stocks did actually worse than the, just the screener itself. You know, you've been doing this for a couple of decades. Any takeaways for sort of the individual investor that's Maybe a do-it-yourselfer? I certainly believe in the choice for people to do it, and I think it helps that they go through the learning curve when they do it themselves. But I think, if anything, what we've learned is for about 98% of the people who think they can manage their own portfolio, where they get into problems is when that portfolio is either dramatically underperforming the S&P 500 or we have a recession and the market's going down and by 20, 30, 40%, quite a few of the people who are actively following the portfolio get scared and abandon the market, usually at the worst point. And furthermore, it's usually several years before they get back in again. So they made two bad timing decisions for the majority of people who basically manage the money themselves. Those who are very cavalier about it and who don't bother to open their financial statements or check online every day or listen to CNBC every day, they actually can do well. You know, they let their money sit for several years through a strategy that they may have picked. They'll be fine. But the most people, it's those challenging times when the market drops or they're underperforming that they lose confidence and, and switch at very inopportune times. So if people were listening today and said, okay, I'm going to start implementing some of these models. We'll do it in a low-cost brokerage or free brokerage account. We'll be tax mindful. Maybe do it in a tax exempt account. But what about right now? A lot of concerns out there from individuals as well as a lot of institutions saying, you know, we're in for potentially a low return environment. Maybe stocks are expensive. Maybe foreign's cheap. What are your general thoughts on portfolio construction? Is it something you think about? Is there anything you guys would add to, you know, an equity only portfolio that you think may be potentially helpful? Sure. You've actually raised a really big question and concern, and that is the U.S. stock market in particular is highly valued by 
most criteria, you know, including especially by the CAPE, although that's not a short-term indicator. I am in agreement that the long-term, let's say the 10-year returns, are likely to be very underwhelming for new money invested at this point of time. And therefore, although I would not say abandon the stock market, I would say, one, you know, international stocks are should be a substantial portion of people's portfolios right now. Value stocks are really, really, really out of favor and have been for a long time. I think that is an area that should be emphasized uh, for the long term. Commodities have also had a terrible run. Could we do to bounce? And then also the other thing for managing portfolios, and I know you're a big believer in this, is trend following to help people get out of the market when the market has taken a very bad technical turn, get them back in the market, I think that will reduce the volatility and allow them to have much more successful returns over the long term. And you mentioned international. Is that something you guys do screening international as well or think about? And do you think it applies in developed and emerging markets similarly as it does in the U.S.? Is it too hard to find the data? What's, what's your general thoughts there? We do it, but we use the ADRs that are listed on the U.S. stock markets. So within that, there are a few hundred ADRs, both emerging countries and developed countries, that it's possible to get a pretty good selection of international companies. Obviously not the biggest or broadest selection, but I think you can be relatively confident in the data that occurs on there, and there's still quite a number of bargains that appear. You know, in a world of opportunity, we talk about this so much where, you know, investors focus so much on their home shores. And it's not just us in in the US, but also our friends in Brazil or Australia or Italy. Everyone seems to to really think about their own own world. So, John, for someone who's been doing this for a while and screening, and you I know you guys offer an automated service. As you look back over doing this, are there anything that if you went back to, say, day one, take a time machine, talk to younger John, say, you know, what are the things you may have done differently or thought about or maybe maybe it's nothing, but is there anything in general, you know, the battle-scarred older investor would maybe tell the, the younger version of you just after you sold your tech company and striking out in the world? That's a very, very interesting question. So I'm thinking about that on the fly. I haven't been asked that before. I think, one, using a trend-following system overall would have been best. It's only in recent years that I've come to the conclusion that that needs to be a part of people's portfolio management systems. Second is diversify among strategies, although I guess I kind of had that feeling relatively early on. Somehow, I was still seeking the holy grail, the one, best one. And it was only after several years that I really realized there's quite a few actually best strategies, but they do come in and out over time. Yeah, it's funny because as you think back, I talked about this a lot on the podcast before, is there's so many lessons that were fantastic lessons to learn, like, you know, having a blowing up your account or losing your money or doing really stupid things, preferably listeners when you have very little money and you can learn those lessons early and not not later. But, you know, you see so much kind of silliness going on in certain pockets of the market today. And, you know, I would never go back and say I shouldn't have those lessons. I would certainly (laughs) never do them again. You often learn more from mistakes than you do from the successes. So, all right, I'd love to keep you forever, but we got about three more questions. We've got to start winding down. What's got you most excited today? So I know you're a curious mind. You're often spending a lot of time in research and thinking about markets and looking for Validia. What sort of research projects are you working on? What sort of new initiatives? Anything else that's in the skunk works? Well, one has to do with a robo-advisor for income investors in particular. But usually it's older people close to or in retirement, they're looking to get a set amount of money from their portfolios. And very few of the rebel portfolios that exist today are designed for that type of investor who's looking to get a much higher yield on his portfolio. And that's challenging, particularly in today's environment. So that has uh, particularly excited as a point of uh, differentiation. 
then the second, the incorporation of more factors. Yeah, you found any good ones lately? I feel like, you know, the challenge there is that, you know, so many brilliant quants out there, you know, have so many access to the more traditional databases. And so the nuggets, in my mind, are often the things that you mentioned, even with momentum, all the different cousins of momentum and different flavors that may be superior to the very just brute force last 12 months. Are there any areas, you don't have to name specific ones if you don't want, but where you think there's particularly high potential to there to be some mining in particular areas? Well, I did mention the variations on momentum. The other area that I'm particularly interested in actually is closed-end funds right now that I'm doing a lot of personal research on. I believe it is possible to identify certain mean reverting funds within certain categories or certain types of closed-end funds and then to find them when their discount in particular is it statistically large standard deviations from where they normally trade. Yeah, and so listeners, closed-in funds, you know, for aren't familiar, similar to an ETF, except that they don't have the arbitrage mechanism so they can trade away from their net asset value. Most often, it's usually plus minus 10%. In some cases, it gets plus minus 20 But there's examples in many cases where that'll be plus minus 50 And one of my favorite examples, one of my favorite case studies and why markets aren't necessarily perfectly efficient is the Cuba closed-in fund. And I have no idea where it's trading now, but that sucker has batted back and forth plus minus 50% in that asset value over time, depending on who's in power, what sort of travel restrictions there are, what's going on. But one of the things that you traditionally want, and you can agree with me or not, John, is that you know, a lot of these funds will trade at a discount forever. So they'll just go down to 10% discount and sit there and, you know, because they have a high fee. Others that oscillate around the net asset value seem to be more opportune for potential trading. Is that something you agree with, disagree with, don't care? No, I agree with it. And that is one of the things that I'm trying to research is how you screen out those that are likely to sit there forever versus those that are likely to mean revert. And one of the other things I'm playing with is then combining that with the traditional price in terms of the variation, particularly if you talk about, let's just say, a segment of closed-end funds that are bond funds. Unlike you know, equity funds, they can't you know, run away one way or the other. So there may be some room there to interpret the price deviation as well as the discount to come up with the right formula. We always think about closed-in funds, and closed-in funds traditionally have a very odd distribution mechanism when they kind of IPO. The initial investors get hit with this 8% traditionally-ish. Yeah, and so like one of the best things you can do as an investor is make sure your broker never, ever puts you into closed-in fund upon launch because they get paid for putting you into it. It's a huge conflict of interest in my mind. It's strange that no competitor hasn't existed to be able to launch closed-in funds. Maybe that's just ETFs. I don't know. But it's always been a strange thing in my mind that the SEC would allow this massive front-end load. Who knows? Shift gears real quick. Two more questions from someone who's been a kind of lifelong tech guy, You know, studied at some of the most prestigious tech schools, have been doing kind of quanti tech stuff for a while. You know, The world's changing pretty fast. All sorts of uh, cool technology getting developed, you know, anything that as your roots are in tech, as you look forward, is is there anything in particular that's got you most excited about technology? What may change the next 10 years? Any just general thoughts, comments? I'm starting to think or look at whether big data techniques can actually help or, you know, put their hands around the financial projections and picking stocks. I'm not entirely convinced that they were because there's there's so much variation, they're big fat tails, but that the potential there has me excited. Interesting. Yeah. I, I struggle. We often call ourselves quant light. And so I sort of bat back and forth between the old Occam's razor, you know, like what is the most simple way we can distill this process and keep it simple. But also there's so many just, you know, shiny dangling trinkets and attractions and, and so many other interesting ideas that Suck me down rabbit holes for months and years on research, too, and new ideas. So I don't have any uh, particular fun takeaways other than the fact there's no investment implications here. But I had bought, which is for sale, by the way, I had bought a PlayStation virtual reality machine. And you can see the the just crazy potential of what's to come in future years. Anyway, really, really fun. 
But also on the flip side, there's a lot of research coming out now that's basically saying, you know, there's a lot of social, emotional, psychological issues with how connected we are. So anyway. All right. So we got to start to wind down. This is blown by. I can't believe we're at an hour already. We always ask our guests a last question, which is what is the most memorable investment or trade that comes to mind in your career? It can be good. It can be bad. It can be an investment. It could be trade, anything that you think of. And you can name more than one if there's a couple, but what's... Okay. I actually have two to share. One was basically in uh, October 20th, 1987, the day after Black Monday, when I woke up to read the headlines that, you know, the Dow had dropped 23%. And unlike everybody around me, I was really excited and I placed a trade, although it was not at all easy to get through to my broker. I think it took three hours of uh, trying buying Novelle at that time. So a company that I was looking at and was very experienced with, and that turned out to be a fantastic trade, both a great time to buy and a fantastic return. So that was one. The second was there was a period of time that I was actually playing the option spread on the January effect where the trade was buying the Value Line 1700 Arithmetic Index future and at the same time shorting either the S&P 500 or the New York Stock Exchange future. So it was sort of a small cap, long, large cap, short on that. And I was able to do that several years in a row successfully, not with, you know, heart-stopping moments because there were points of time when the trade went against you by more than 5%. Of course, that wipes out your equity and you're almost facing a margin call and then it magically reverses on that. But that proved to be a successful trade until finally the value index future was having so few shares basically sold on it that that became a very risky trade. There was no like no liquidity left. I love those sort of ideas. I'm going to have to revisit. We used to write about something similar like that, man, probably 10 years ago. We'll have to, we'll have to walk it forward and see how it does. John, it's been a blast, a lot of fun. Where can investors find more information, podcast listeners on you, your company, all that good stuff? So a great starting point for learning more about our system is my research site, validia.com, V as in Victor, A-L-I-D-E-A.com. So that actually contains our free and subscription research, as well as links to money management offerings. And you can also follow me on Twitter via at Guru Investor. Awesome. We'll add show note links to all those and post them online. John Reese, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Matt. Podcast listeners, it's been a fun episode. We've talked about a lot. So I will definitely add all these show links to mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. You can always find the archives there as well as we'd love for you to leave a review. Good, bad, whatever. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Castro, Overcast. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing. Today's episode is brought to you by Personal Capital. Personal Capital offers insightful, free tools that help you manage all of your finances in a single location with one secure login. The tools are free, personalized, easy to set up and use, and give investors a convenient way to gain transparency into their finances. I know because I've been using the online tool for years for a holistic picture of my financial life, including investments and overall net worth. Today, for listeners of the Meb Faber Show, Personal Capital is offering a special deal. Two months of free advisory services on top of the already free tools. To learn more and claim two months free, just go to personalcapital.com forward slash Meb. Again, that's personalcapital.com forward slash Meb. <laughs>